this call is being recorded uh, so all the calls from the the webinars so you can get access to them uh, so if you don't want to like appear on the call or anything just like uh, be mindful of that and put your question in the chat um, and today we have the open licensing webinar uh, where you get to ask uh, all sorts of like different questions about the licenses and the legal aspects of the license and today for this webinar we have Carl Walsh and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Carl. Um, Carl Walsh is an attorney focusing on free knowledge and free software. She was one of the Create Commons legal team behind version 4.0 of the CC license work and has recently returned to Create Commons as general counsel. She has a long involvement in free and open projects, has served on the boards of Wikimedia and the Free Software Foundation, and has been legal counsel to nonprofits and technology startup, startups sorry, that work in the open. Kate is based just north of San Francisco and when not practicing law, is probably paying, playing bassoon, which I have no idea what it is, but <laughs> maybe that's a question I should have included in the talk. Um, and so, <laughs> Kate is gonna go through the questions that we have in the questions talk that uh, Jen just shared. Um, and if you happen to have a question that is not covered in the in the doc, you can also ask it yourself on the chat or just like unmute your microphone and um, ask your question. And thanks for being here today um, to all of you as participants and to Kat. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Great, thank you. Uh... Uh, it is lovely to be here, and uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to start out uh, with a little spiel that will uh, prove to you that I actually am a lawyer, which is to say I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. Uh, so I cannot give you legal advice. Like if you have a particular situation, uh, I cannot tell you what to do. Uh, but what I can do is try and give you as much information as I have about the general principles and like the things you might want to consider if you have that situation, uh, or just answer questions that you're curious about. Uh, so I see there is a great document with a lot of very difficult questions, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if everyone who has asked those questions is here. Uh, like I know that uh, not always, ever, sometimes the people who have asked the questions are not actually in the webinar, so I'd like to prioritize the people who are here in the room. Uh, so if people want to uh, start by asking their questions or by pointing, pointing out one in the document that is theirs, uh, that's what I'll start with. Either that or I'm just going to pick it random. <laughs> Maybe let's start with the artificial intelligence one, since like okay. that's uh, the hot topic. <laughs> oh yeah, everybody wants to know about artificial intelligence. Uh, so let's see, I'll start with the one about, can you utilize AI in the creation of a copyrighted or CC licensed work? Uh, if you use AI, is the work automatically in the public domain? Uh, should you use an attribution or citation for the portion of a CC licensed work that AI was used to create? Like, uh, this is a great one because it's uh, a lot of this is still being hashed out right now, uh, both in uh, both in the courts in various jurisdictions and in what people think is customary to do. Uh, right now, in most of the jurisdictions that I'm aware of, work created solely by an AI uh, is not copyrightable. It's considered to be in a in the public domain because uh, copyrighted work needs a human author. Uh, that said, like sometimes it kind of depends on how it was created. Like AI is uh, referred to as a lot of different things from people just putting in a putting in a prompt for you. Like you know you type in uh, you know field of flowers with a cat and you, and it spits out a picture of field of flowers with a cat. Uh, to somebody who has like actually done a lot of work into like engineering a prompt or providing some source images that get manipulated and like that's a little bit more unclear. Uh, so for like if AI is used to like assist with the creation of a work and there's some portion of a work that was human created like you know you used either source imagery that was manipulating or you manipulated the output like that part can be copyrighted by the whatever human author, uh, whatever human author uh, was participating in that work. And uh, there are some examples of artists who used AI uh, significantly, like in the creation of their work. Uh, and one of the one of the famous examples uh, in the U.S. particularly was somebody who used AI to 
co-create a comic book, uh, basically, where she used AI to make some of the illustrations for the work, but provided the story and uh, and set up the scenes, things like that. So that was kind of a co-created work where that author had the copyright uh, in the parts that they created, but not in the parts that were just uh, just AI. Uh, so it can be difficult, but basically, like you can use AI to create uh, to co-create a copyrighted work. Uh, the parts that were human created, you can. Uh, can be copyrightable, and you can put a CC license on those the same as any other work. The parts that just came from AI uh, are considered public domain in all, all the jurisdictions that I know about. Uh, where to draw that line and how to separate that out is a much tougher question. Uh, the same way it is as if you're you incorporating public domain works or like sound art, things like that, in, in any other creation. Like, say you're like making a collage that's uh, based of based off of public domain art that you cut out of art books or like a, you know, a public domain text that you manipulate somehow, like what's yours and what's the source material that's not always easy to determine. And uh, sometimes it cannot be easy to determine with AI also. And there's a question there in the chat. Um, since like we were like telling them to prioritize those, do you want me to read it aloud or do you want to go ahead and read it out loud? Uh, I, I can go ahead and read it aloud. Uh, and I see one asking uh, if a YouTube video or other format that allows advertising revenue counts as a commercial use or if it's still okay to use NC licensed work in the context. Uh, so we don't clearly define what non-commercial is. Uh, the licenses specify like not primarily for like financial or economic advantage. Uh, there, there was a survey maybe uh, about 10 or 15 years ago about what people think is commercial. Uh, we would generally say that if you are getting advertising revenue directly from displaying a Creative Commons licensed work, that that would generally be considered a commercial use. Uh, you're making you're making money from distributing this uh, this copyrighted work. Uh, so if you're getting ad revenue from a YouTube video, like probably like um, this is one of the specific situations where there may be facts that determine one way or the other. But uh, generally, if you're making money from distributing the work, that would usually be considered a commercial use. Uh, in that case, if you're not sure about it, uh, ask the licensor of the work, like see if it's okay with them, like see if uh, you can negotiate another license with them. Uh, but in general, when you're making money directly from a, from a work, uh, it's, it can be a little bit difficult to, uh, to say, like say for example, you run a blog or a website where there are just advertisements on the website in general and you, you include an NC licensed image in your blog post, like is that commercial or not? That's a little bit of a gray area. Like uh, we don't have a specific determination on that. Uh, and always, if you're not sure, uh, ask the licensor if it's possible. Oh, great. And and thanks for the uh, uh, info in the, the, the link to that study in the chat, uh, which will probably answer some questions and uh, make some others more confusing that you thought you already knew the answer to. The usual advice I like to give people who are wondering what to do uh, in like attribution or com commercial use, et cetera, if the answer is not black and white, is to uh, do something that you wouldn't be embarrassed to explain to the author or to a judge, uh, because that's often what it what it comes down to. Uh, so um, maybe we could like go with the machine readable and the machine readable metadata. There are like two questions around machine readable <laughs> metadata and li layers. So that might be like good to answer them in bulk, let's say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the CC licenses, uh, for those who aren't aware, they have three layers. There's the legal code, which is, you know, the uh, legally enforceable text. Uh, there's the deed, which often gets called the human readable layer, which is basically a summary of what's in the legal code. Uh, and the machine readable layer, which is intended to provide a bunch of metadata that lets computers and search engines and uh, various systems uh, basically communicate as much of that information that's in the legal code and the deed uh, as possible. Uh, what it is, uh, so there isn't, when you choose a CC license, there's no registry system. Like there's no central database of like who is using a CC license or who's connected to a work. Uh, it is 
it's just between you and the reusers. So you mark your work with a CC license, somebody sees that and can identify what they can do with that. Uh, the machine readable layer is just basically another way of marking your work uh, in the same way that marking your work with the, the visual symbol or with the text information is. Uh, it doesn't add it to a registry. Uh, if you're working in a format where you can't reasonably use the machine readable layer, it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't need it to make it valid. Uh, what it does do is let some systems that use that layer, uh, for example, uh, search engines or like uh, mostly like search engines and uh, repositories of information that might use that information in order to find help you find the works you want to use. So you're looking for works that allow commercial reuse or allow derivatives might use the machine readable layer to help find those works. Uh, it's it's mainly it's mainly applicable to uh, websites and digital works. Uh, there's a question of can it be applied to other works such as digital files of draft graphics text? Uh, basically, anything where you can include a little snippet of code, uh, you can use the machine readable layer on, and it will be used by uh, whatever systems there are that uh, that that use that data in order to help reusers find what they need. Uh, I hope that answered the question. I'm not sure if there are any other aspects that people were looking for. Yeah, um, Chen is also sending a reminder out in the chat that uh, you can unmute yourself um, or put a question in the chat. Um, otherwise, we'll just go through like the document that we have for this webinar where people were asked to put post their questions in advance. Uh, so then like we can ask them to cut. But if you happen to have like a question that you when I get answered right now, Kat is gonna prioritize the questions for the people that is already here. So let's see. Oops. Kat, so I was wondering you. if I could... <laughs> Sorry to bombard yeah, you ahead. with questions right away. Um, another question I had was around the uh, no derivatives portion. So mm -hmm. in this recent section of the course, we talked about, or there was a note about how uh, with non-derivatives in the CC licenses, it just means that there can't be a derivative that is made available for the public, but that an individual could make a derivative. And so I was wondering, what is the actual use case for someone being able to make a derivative that's not available to the public. Like if I made something for like my grandma, would that count as making a derivative for the public? Or um, yeah, just some more context on that would be super helpful. Sure, so usually the conditions of the license apply when you like share a work. And that's, that's basically defined as like making a copy in some way that you publicly distribute. And if you're doing something just for yourself or even like within your family or like within you're just giving it to your best friend or something like that, where you're not really publicly dis distributing it, uh, publicly distributing it, uh, you're not making it available to people beyond, uh, you know, beyond a very limited set. Uh, that would that wouldn't really be considered sharing the work uh, and you can uh, you can do whatever you want. You don't need to follow the license conditions. So. You know, say you read a book that's uh, that's under a non-derivatives license, and you make a fanfic of it, like either just for yourself, uh, or you, uh, or you're only sharing it with your friends. You're not you're not making it widely available for others. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's permitted. You're not you're not distributing it. You're not distributing it uh, in the same way that you can make works for yourself. Uh, you know, you can copy a piece of art that you like in order to like learn how to draw things like uh, things that are like a private use and not like you're, you're making another distribution of the work. Let's see. And I see there's another question in the doc about, uh, about ND, like there was, uh, can you revise it as long as you don't share it? And uh, yes, you can. You can do you can do pretty much anything you want if you're not going to share it. Uh, and can you take a piece of the book with the license and share it? Uh, so in in general, yes. Like uh, you can make an excerpt of a non derivative work uh, as long as you're not altering that excerpt. We're not doing so in ways that would that are making a new creative work out of it. Uh, so. 
making it making a derivative. And uh, I will say that I am a U.S. trained lawyer. Most of my knowledge is in U.S. law. Uh, there are a lot of principles that are uh, the same in copyright around the world because of the, the international treaties around it. But uh, I will say that a lot of what I know is based in U.S. law. So if you do know something that it differs a little bit, uh, I will try to be mindful of those differences. But please correct me if you know something that differs. Uh, it, but in general, making a derivative work under copyright law uh, involves taking an original work and adding something creative of your own to it so that you're combining your creative contribution and the original to make a new work out of it. Uh, and taking an excerpt uh, generally is not that. You're just copying the work. Uh, you're not copying the entire work. You're copying a part of it, but it's still just making a copy. Uh, I can, I'm sure there are some ways that are of doing that that would be making a derivative, like you've somehow changed the meaning of the work or like at, or taking that excerpt puts a new creative interpretation on it. But in general, just taking an excerpt, uh, like say if you have a book and you take a chapter because you only need the one chapter, that would generally not be considered making a derivative. And there are like kind of extensions on the question of derivatives. So um, there's like Julie is asking in the chat, um, if it's revised, can I show it to a class? And then you have a very long question um, on derivatives that I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to read it or not. Yeah, so showing, showing it to a class is interesting. Like uh, I would that would usually considered be considered distributing it publicly, like uh, educational use is not, uh, is not considered to be private use. Uh, you know, it kind of depends on the situation, but uh, a lot of countries have exceptions and limitations. Uh, in the US, this is fair use. Uh, other countries have others that allow for, for commentary and educational use. So, you know, if you're making a remix and showing it to a class for, for some educational purpose or for criticism or commentary, you may be allowed to do that uh, anyway, uh, but it, it can be very fact specific. Uh, for example, if you're taking a work apart and putting commentary sections on it in order to teach about it, in order to compare and contrast it with another work, you may be able to do that even if the work is uh, non-derivatives. Uh, if you're just making a remix because you think it uh, would be a funny parody, like. That may not fall under uh, an educational use exception because you're not you're not kind of commenting on the work itself. You're just creating another you're just creating another work based on it for for entertainment. Yeah, uh, it can be hard to separate that out. Um, sometimes, uh, for example, people will uh, people will make an educational work no derivatives because they want to sell you services on top of it, like they want to. Like they, they want to be able to sell you a revised version if they want to, uh, so things like that. Um, it's also, you know, so, so in general, I'd say like, if you're, if you're doing something that falls under an educational use except, exception in your jurisdiction, you should be okay with it, uh, even if the license would ordinarily not allow it, allow it, but uh, if it wouldn't, and that really depends on the facts of exactly what you're doing and what your jurisdiction allows. Yeah, and I see- So the question is question. about the United Arab, like Arab Emirates. So it's how they define a derived work. And um, the person is like curious to know whether the uh, non-derivative license would be more restrictive there um, considering what the law says, which says that like um, like collections of literary and artistic works and collections of uh, folklore expression, as long as they are innovative in their arrangement or the choice of their contents, are considered derivative works. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one, and I think I would agree with you that it's more uh, non derivatives would be more restrictive in that jurisdiction. Uh, I'd be really interested to see, and I'm not very familiar with uh, how the law is interpreted there. Is like what counts as innovative. Uh, I know a lot, a lot of jurisdictions, including the U.S., also allow for some creativity in collections if it is like innovative or creative. Uh, but the bar for what is creative versus what is just like kind of mechanical uh, is pretty high uh, for collections. Uh, but I don't know how that's interpreted in the UAE, and you'd probably want to see. Uh, you'd probably want to consult somebody local who's familiar with the law. Which question would you like to tackle next? Or maybe like, let's give 
a few moments there to see if like any of the participants is interested in opening the mic their mic sorry <laughs> and ask a question See if nobody is uh, speaking up. I'll take one from uh, like a pretty basic question from the the doc that I think doesn't get answered a lot is what makes the CC licenses legally enforceable all over the world? And uh, the thing that does that is uh, pr basically every country in the world has some sort of copyright law that you know grants a grants the exclusive right to copyright copy and distribute to anybody who creates a creative work. Uh, Unlike a lot of areas of law, copyright law has a lot of similarities across the world because of an international treaty called the Berne Convention, which uh, which sets the basic guidelines for what all the signatories uh, to this should have in their copyright law. And uh, basically every country uh, is a signatory to this. There might be a, a small handful that aren't, but uh, all, almost everywhere in the world has grants some sort of exclusive right. Uh, what the CC licenses do, uh, is they say like, okay, you have this bundle of rights that is broadly the same uh, across the world, and you're gonna give some of them away. Uh, and that mechanism also works very similarly across all the, all the countries in the world. Like, okay, you have these rights, but you are allowed to license them to other people under certain conditions. Uh, so the CC licenses say what rights you're licensing and under what conditions. Uh, and, uh, one thing that is interesting uh, about the 4.0 licenses, the most recent version, uh, is that we did consult with uh, lawyers uh, all across the world, uh, prob probably about 100 countries, to say, like, okay, does this work with your national law? Because every every national implementation of copyright law is a little bit different, even though they share a lot of similarities. Uh, so can we make one legal document that uh, that has basically the same effect across the world? Uh, and you will see there are some regional differences. For example, different countries might uh, define derivative work a little bit differently, or different countries might call their rights uh, certain things. Uh, some countries have stronger like database rights or moral rights, uh, but a lot of the broad strokes are the same so that one document can apply to all of them. Uh, it's in a, This is a change from previous versions. Uh, you might see that there are uh, that were designed to uh, to work with uh, particular countries laws and we tried to we tried to like reconcile all those differences 4.0 so you didn't have to be so that you didn't have to like uh, be concerned with the differences between country ported versions uh, you could just use one document that how it would have basically the same effect across the world uh, and you'll see some language in the licenses that says like to the extent allowed by applicable law uh, because uh, because of those differences between jurisdictions um, maybe, Kaja, since you are talking about versioning, we could go to the question um, that we have here on the document about, is it possible to update a CC license? For instance, if a work was licensed under a 3.0, uh, um, does it automatically upgrade to a 4.0 license? Are there any specific ways to apply the newest version of a license? Yeah, uh, so these are, uh, so these are two different versions. Uh, there is no automatic upgrade. Uh, so if you got a work that was available to you under a 3.0 license, uh, you can't automatically distribute it under a 4.0 license. You have to keep using 3.0. Uh, there are some very slight differences between the licenses, which you can see on our license versions page, uh, which is up. Uh, if you are the rights holder, if you are the one who the, applied the CC license, uh, you can always update. You can always update to the next version. Uh, the technicality of what happens with that is like it's actually available under both license terms, uh, but you don't have to keep saying that. Uh, you can just uh, you can you can only uh, you can advertise only the 4.0 version. Uh, most people won't care that it is also available under 3.0. Uh, in some cases, that they might. Uh, if you have a work. Uh, that is under 3.0, like a book or an artwork or something, and you want to make a remix of it. Uh, you were allowed to make, you were allowed to make a remix of it and uh, add your original material under 4.0. So say, you know, there's a book like uh, the book is available under CC by SA. Uh, you'd like to add new material and new chapters to it. Uh, 
you can make everything that you originally created under BIASA 4.0, even though the original book is under 3.0. Uh, but what you can't do is, uh, yeah, but what you can't do is call all that old material uh, 4.0. Like, and this is uh, this is because it is an updated license. It is a different legal document. Uh, we looked into this question when we were writing the new version, and basically somebody can't agree to a legal document that they've never seen. So somebody who put their work uh, under a 3.0 license uh, before 4.0 existed had no idea what 4.0 would say. The, like they can't agree to have their work distributed under those terms. What some websites have done have put in their terms of use that says like, okay, if you upload a work, like you're gonna, you're gonna let us, you know, you're going to let us change the license on you. You agree to whatever cha uh, changes may come up. Uh, that's a that's a thing that's possible to do. You uh, you can do that through terms of use or contracts or things like that. But it isn't an automatic process. Uh, you have to you have to proactively agree to it. And there's a question around irrevocability there too as well. That I think it's important to what you are saying too around like the license versioning, which is once a copyright holder applied a CC license to a work, is he or she allowed to change his mind and remove it or apply another license? Yeah, so the CC license, uh, you cannot revoke the CC licenses once you've applied it. Uh, so we always encourage you to think very carefully about like what it is that you need from the work and what it is that you want people to do with it before you apply a license. Uh, that said, what you can do, uh, you don't have to keep advertising your choice. Like say you originally published your work under CC BY uh, and you wish that you hadn't, like you wish you had made it CC BY SA for some reason. Like. You can you can stop advertising that it was ever available under CC BY. You can change all the language on your website. You can change all the language on any copies that you have. Uh, somebody who who got it under CC BY, who knows that it was originally under CC BY, can keep using it that way because you can't uh, you can't uh, undo your choice. But most people won't know about it if you don't tell them. Uh, and so. Uh, you know, if you if you just completely stop advertising that it was ever available that way, people will probably stop using it that way. Uh, and we encourage people who are reusing, like if they know that a licensor has changed their mind, uh, if they don't need to use that work, we do encourage them to respect that choice. Like even if they are legally entitled to use it under the original license, uh, there may be, uh, if you have a strong need to use that work or you were relying on it, like say you saw it under the original license and you. Put a lot of effort into making a derivative work that you wouldn't be able to uh, that you wouldn't be able to make under the new license. It, uh, it wouldn't be fair to uh, it wouldn't be fair to make that person lose all their work because you changed your mind. Uh, so that's part of why the licenses are not revocable. Uh, but uh, but yeah, like that's the balance. You don't have to keep advertising it, but somebody who originally found it uh, is entitled to keep using it uh, under that license. Great. Um, um, yeah, uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was uh, going to say, especially because the CC licenses don't have any uh, registry, you can't often track reuse. So somebody may have gotten it that you, you know, that, that has no idea that you changed your mind, like has never seen the new, like uh, has never seen the new terms. So, you know, m making, making that person have to like keep monitoring the original source uh, wouldn't you know that that wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be very equitable. So we have we have to let people rely on the the terms that they originally got. I mean, this is particularly true whenever like you are doing this on Wikimedia Commons, right? And uploading mm -hmm. photos from iNaturalist or from Flickr, mm -hmm. and like people might change their mind on the original platform, but then like Wikimedia Commons like does not have any way to like track some of those things. So. Um, yeah, that's um, that's right. There's often not a good connection. You have no idea if somebody uh, if somebody changed the terms on another site. So. Indeed. So, um, which one would you like to tackle next? Maybe we can go to the first one, uh, which I think is a it's a little bit out of the scope of the realm of the licenses, but I think it's a good question. <laughs> so, it's what happens if a copyright holder no longer exists and the person like put us a scenario. A corporate entity owns copyright in some words, but then the corporate entity 
dissolves. Does the work revert to the public domain? There's no corporation anymore and there are no corporate heirs. So what happens to the copyrights that they hold? So, so in, in general, like, uh, in general, like, nothing is ever unowned, but uh, like, uh, but sometimes people don't know that they own a work. Uh, so I'm not an expert uh, in in uh, in like corporations and like what happens in the dissolution. So, and I, this may differ in different jurisdictions also. Uh, what usually happens is when a corporation dissolves, the assets go somewhere. Uh, they they either get sold off to somebody who buys the corporate assets, or they revert to the owners of the company. Uh, it depends on the corporate structure and like how it wound down and what the rules are in your jurisdiction. But usually, whatever that company owned ends up owned by somebody. Uh, and a lot of times, the copyrights to the creative works may get forgotten in that somebody owns them, but they don't know the they don't know that they do, or they're not paying attention to it. Uh, and this often results in what. Uh, often gets called or orphan works, uh, which are, you know, they're works that are copyrighted, like they're they're still around, they're still owned, the copyright is still valid, but the the owner of that work doesn't doesn't know or care about them anymore. Like you can't track them down for licensing, like you don't know you don't know how to find them. Like you might not even have any information about when the work was created so that you know when it's gonna go into the public domain. But it's still there's still the possibility that uh the, that the copyright owner might wake up one day and decide that they're going to enforce their copyrights and they would have uh, the legal right to do that, uh, which is which is extremely unfortunate. Like there's a lot of works that uh, probably should be available to the public that nobody cares about anymore, but uh, nobody, or at least the copyright holder doesn't care about anymore, but like that the public might like to use and there's not a good legal solution uh, for, for being able to use those. Uh, whether you want to use them in your own use for like whatever purposes you have really depends on your your tolerance for risk. Uh, it may technically be a copyright violation to use a work from a company that has dissolved and uh, nobody is tracking down anymore. Uh, but if you you really know that nobody knows and cares about it, like you may decide that risk is worth it to you. Uh, if you're working in a context where it's very important to have rights and clearances, uh, this can be a super frustrating situation and you just may not be able to use that work because you just can't track down the copyright holder. Great. So then a reminder that you can open your mic and ask your question, or if you want, you can also write it in the chat. Um, if not, time for you to pick, <laughs> Kat, which one would you like to tackle next? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I'll take the next one like a, that I see there. Uh, if a student creates work that includes CC by and C materials and then uh, uses the work in a portfolio for a job, is that a violation of the non-commercial clause? Uh, so we talked a little bit about non-commercial earlier and like primarily for economic advantage, et cetera. You know, if in that context, like uh, I would find it, I would find it very hard to believe that a licensor would try to enforce their commercial rights uh, in that case, and I would find it very hard to believe that a judge would determine that they had uh, that they had violated the license. Uh, it's really more of a private contract, uh, private context where you're you're showcasing your skills with the work, but you're not making money directly from that work. Uh, it would be it would be different if you were distributing it and getting paid directly from it versus just using it as a showcase of your skills. Uh, but uh, I could see somebody taking a different opinion, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to offer an opinion that says like, yes, this is different, definitely non-commercial, but I would, uh, I would find it very difficult to believe that anyone would, uh, would get, uh, hit with a copyright infringement penalty for, for doing that. There's another question about a non-commercial. Do you want to go with that one? Can a non-commercial license work be used in a commercial context? Context. Yeah. Uh, so that one, like, so the non-commercial license does apply to the use of the work, the particular use of the work, uh, rather than the user. So, uh, you know, if, if, for example, you were a for-profit company and you were somehow using a uh, and you can think of a context where, like, that company might use the work non-commercially in some fashion. Like, you know, you could consider that a commercial context. Like, uh, in uh, there's also uh, 
if you would like to use a non-commercial work in a way that you think is commercial, uh, ask the licensor. Uh, the CC licenses are non-exclusive. Uh, if you apply a CC license and say you can't use it under the CC license term, uh, you would like to reuse that CC licensed work and you can't follow the CC license terms for whatever reason. Uh, you'd like to make a commercial use of a non-commercial work or you'd like to make a derivative of a non-derivatives work. Uh, you can always ask the licensor for different terms and they're always free to offer them to you. Well, and that actually takes us um, like very smoothly to our next question, right? Because I think it's a very complex uh, one. It's in the Made with Creative Commons book, the chapter on Cory Doctorow, Doctorow oh, sorry, says his science fiction is published with a CC by NC share alike license. Then author Stacy and Pearson reveal he always sells the right to translate the book to other languages to a commercial publisher first. Because if fan translations are available for free, it is difficult to get people to pay for a translation. And he wants buyers in other parts of the world. So my question is twofold. One, do you know whether the publisher of foreign rights is okay with him selling the foreign rights and then posting the work under a Creative Commons license? Typically, how do publishers handle works with Creative Commons licenses? Doesn't it make the works undesirable to publishers? Yeah, and like, and so I I know from the authors that I've spoken to that this can be really that this can be really difficult, and I think even Cory Doctorow has tr trouble with it sometimes. Like he had a very good relationship with his publisher at the time; he'd worked with them a lot, and uh, uh, I think they knew that his books would make money even if he uh, did it under this uh, crazy free licensing scheme that he wanted to do. Uh, it can be a lot harder for for newer authors or people who are trying something different. Uh, so it really depends on you having a you having negotiating power with your publisher to do this and trying to make a trying to uh, make a scenario that both makes money for them and lets you you do what you want and sometimes you can't come to that compromise uh, uh, there are a lot of different scenarios that people have tried and there are some case studies in our in our book and there are others uh, case studies that uh, people have published uh, some people do a kind of time limited thing where the work is actually all rights reserved for a little while, and then after a couple of years, they might uh, loosen up the rights on it. Uh, some people do do a thing where they where they like release some rights uh, and and keep others to to sell translations. Uh, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the organization Authors Alliance, uh, it's a great resource for authors, particularly in the United States, uh, as as usual. But uh, uh, has a lot of resources for authors who want to release some of their rights publicly and, uh, you know, guides for negotiating contracts and things like that. Uh, everybody's situation is different. Uh, even uh, Corey has said that it's gotten a lot more difficult to deal with publishers and releasing rights over the past decade or so just because it's gotten so much harder to make money in that business. And I think uh, even he's had a harder time putting CC licenses on his books. Uh, we had a podcast with him about two years ago where he's talked a little bit more about the process. Uh, and about how much uh, more difficult it's gotten to uh, deal with publishers. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's a different situation if you're coming up as a new author versus uh, an established author. But uh, often you, you can come up with a situation that makes sense, whether that is time limited rights, whether that is only uh, whether that is only releasing some sort of rights under, uh, you know, uh, like trying to sell the translations first. Uh, I'm not an expert in the, the business of publishing books, so I don't know what makes money for publishers now. Uh, but uh, if you can come to some sort of solution that like still lets the publisher make their money, uh, often you can negotiate that. Yeah, and that's actually a great point because I think that um, like the, we're talking mainly about like literary authors here, but like rights retention is actually a big deal in the scientific world uh, where <laughs> a lot of like uh, researchers want to keep their rights. And I see that um, Molly is actually asking a question there on the chat, and she's um, my understanding is that the legal code of the Creative Commons licenses is designed to be superseded by copyright law. But in most cases with regular license, licenses, any licensing restrictions, even those permitted under fair use will govern. Is that correct? So this, yes. So let's see. Uh, so, so I'll start with the CC licenses, uh, which 
which do explicitly say that uh, any limitations and exceptions in copyright law, like uh, the over, oh, basically override the licenses, you're still allowed to take advantage of any limitations and exceptions, like you know fair use or freedom of panorama or uh, you know uh, text and data mining rights, uh, even if you might think that the license conditions would otherwise uh, exclude them. Uh, in many cases, it it depends. Like, uh, and I, and we have generally said that our licenses are not intended to be interpreted as contracts between parties. So the, uh, uh, and that that may differ in interpretation. You may uh, come to a jurisdiction that does interpret some of uh, the CC license terms as contracts rather than licenses. Uh, that can get kind of technical into the weeds is what that means, but basically like what remedies are available to you, what happens if you violate some of the conditions. Uh, many other licensing terms are intended to be considered as contracts between you and the person offering you the license. Uh, so while you may have a fair use right to do a certain thing, like make a remix or like use it in an educational setting, uh, their position might be that you have entered into a contract with them not to do that thing, uh, even if copyright law would say that that you had. Uh, and that's often the case. They will often include a lot of terms and restrictions that you couldn't you couldn't enforce you couldn't enforce in court as a copyright infringement, but you could enforce in court as a contract uh, as to what you will do. Uh, so that's that's generally what will happen, uh, and uh, the specifics of of that are difficult, but that's generally the theory of why they will do that. They will say that you have entered into a contact a contract with them uh, to not do those things, even if even if it wouldn't be copyright that stopped you. Great. So um, does anyone else have any other questions? You can open your mic or write it them in the chat. See. If not, there's, well, I think there's one last question, yeah, for you in the document. One more. And like, is a CC license applicable to a data set, for example, in a scholarly context? Uh, and the answer is maybe. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, data sets that would not be copyrightable. Like, they're like a lot of like figures, a lot of uncopyrightable material. Uh, they're not arranged in any creative way. You just collected all the data and like put it together. Like, that's, that's generally not copyrightable. Uh, a lot of people do put it, the CC0 legal tool on it to uh, say that like, this is in the public domain, whatever rights that I might have, like I, I waive them, like this is this is free to use. Uh, but what what is data uh, is, a, has, is a question that only keeps getting more and more complicated. Uh, for example, data might be like you've, you've collected a bunch of narrative reports from a bunch of people that you've inter interviewed. Uh, and those in themselves, like those stories that you collected would individually be copyrightable material. So uh, it kind of depends on like, what is data? Like then you have a collection of a bunch of copyrightable objects. Uh, you have a bunch of historical photo photographs, like that can be a data set and some of those can be copyrighted. Uh, frequently that refers to the individual materials and not like the data set, the, like the collection, which, uh, is often not creative, but dictated by like the terms of like, you've just tried to create, collect all of the things that exist, or you've tried to collect all of the things that like were within the bounds of your study. Um, uh, in some jurisdictions, you can have database rights over those depending on like the effort that you took to create them and like some of the other conditions. Uh, the CC licenses do, uh, do address database rights and attempt to license those uh, as well. Uh, some jurisdictions don't have them at all, uh, in which case, unless it would be considered a copyrightable creative work, there's not a whole lot of rights in the like the collection of the data versus the individual pieces themselves. Uh, but in the scholarly context, a lot of data that is collected is just not copyrightable at all. Uh, there might be other concerns that would determine how you might want to distribute the work. Uh, for example, a lot of data collected might uh, include a lot of personal and private information, and you might restrict restrict who can access that, even if it's completely uncopyrightable, like people's medical or genetic information. You might you might keep a close handle on who could distribute that or like have some contractual restrictions on who could access that, uh, even if it's uh, even if it's not copyright, just because it's uh, private information. Uh, other regulations like privacy laws uh, might apply. Uh, even where privacy laws might not apply, you might have other concerns like 
uh, people collecting data from uh, indigenous communities that just uh, don't want that data shared uh, beyond a certain context. Uh, you might request that people not share that even if it's not copyrightable. Um, some of it people just might want to keep private until they have released their paper. They might put uh, an embargo on it so people don't scoop their research. Uh, also not, not necessarily copyrightable, but something that you might control access to in some other fashion. Um, great. I think that for in the case that you're mentioning, my understanding is that there's um, like something called like for the case of indigenous people, though, like for their data, they do they don't have like copyright, but they do have a set of like uh, principles, like the care statement for indigenous mm -hmm. data sovereignty, and then they have something called like OCA. Um, so yeah, just like be aware. We always like say this in the course, and you've seen it over and over again. Like. Um, I'll write my apply <laughs> um, that are not like necessarily copyright. Um, so that's the end of the questions. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to like jump in, ask another question, like ask Kat to follow up on something um, or write your question on the chat. Um, If not, we still have like 15 minutes and maybe like Kat, you would like to expand a little bit on what are some of the common legal challenges users and creators, uh, sorry, users and creators face in relation to licenses, fair use, fair dealing, remix, et cetera. Yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, I, think a, I think a lot of it, uh, a lot of the questions that come up are just like, uh, first of all, what is a remix? Like, what is a derivative work? Uh, we gave a gave a little bit of that. Uh, basically, something that is, uh, uh, and uh, you're taking a bit of source material and you're combining it with something new. Uh, but when have you when have you simply made like alterations uh, alterations to a copy? And when have you created a remix? Uh, people like often would like to make would like to ask that question, particularly in the context of share alike licenses where you're uh where if you make a remix they have to be under specific terms or non-derivatives works where you're you're allowed to make slight alterations like to take an excerpt as just described earlier but not to make a remix like when does that happen uh and the answer is uh that it's extremely fact specific uh it's hard to make a black and white determination uh, uh in in these cases, like if you're not sure, uh, asking the licensor is always a way to go. Or uh, a lot of legal questions are not very black and white, uh, and the best thing to do is to consult with your counsel. Uh, your uh, if you're at an institution, you probably have an institutional counsel. Or uh, uh, if you're not, you may be able to consult with somebody like uh, the, there are organizations like New Media Rights and some others, uh, volunteer lawyers for the arts, things like that, that will do consultations where they can basically talk you through the risks. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the answers are not like, you can definitely do this or you can definitely not do this, but like, like well, this is probably okay, but it depends on what your concerns are and what, uh, what would happen if this went wrong. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're publishing a very expensive book and you're gonna sell it to universities, maybe you're gonna be very, uh, a lot more careful about rights. And if you're publishing something on your blog and if somebody contact, you're not making any money from it and if somebody contacted you, you would just fix it. Well, yeah, what else is, uh, what else is interesting? Uh, <laughs> what, what has been the most like weird question that you face as a, <laughs> And in your like tenure with Creative Commons. Oh man. Uh, so I think one of my favorite thing, I think it came from another cert webinar, in fact, where somebody had like was a librarian doing like special collections. Uh, and they had a library of like of sculptures. And I believe they had a library of sculptures made from like unconventional materials. I want to say cheese. I want to say that like these were cheese sculptures. Uh, and we had a discussion about like, can you apply CC licenses to like materials in the in the physical world and sculptures? And like, you know, what if somebody wanted to CC license their cheese sculpture? Like, you can do that. Uh, I I have no guidance on how you should mark that work. Like, uh, pr you know, probably with a placard to the side. But I like to imagine that it's kind of carved into the bottom person, something like that. Uh, or maybe with some bacon. <laughs> maybe with some bacon. 
like I, uh, I feel like I feel like you'd have to preserve it very well uh, to do that. Uh, I've also had Any... somebody. Uh, Oh, yeah. I've had somebody ask about tattoos before, like if they want to use CC licensed art as a tattoo, like how do you properly credit the artist for that? Because uh, you're not going to tattoo the, the CC license on your body, probably. Uh, and uh, the answer is, I don't know, but frequently like uh, the, guides for, the guidance for attribution uh, in any context is basically to do what is reasonable to like the, the medium and context of the work. And like, what's reasonable in the context of a tattoo, I genuinely don't know, but uh, you know, you might acknowledge the work, like if it appears prominently in a photograph, you might like mention in a caption, or you know, if somebody asks you who did your art, you might like hand the business card. But yeah, uh, what the CC licenses are pretty flexible because they are designed to be used in a lot of contexts that we could never anticipate when writing them. Uh, but to to do something that seems that seems fair uh, to the creator that does acknowledge their work in the way that you would, would expect the work to be acknowledged. Um, amazing. So Jordan uh, saying goodbye. Um, and she says that this has been really helpful. Uh, and I think that we don't have that much time left anyways. So um, unless, Kat, you want to um, you know, if you have any final words, um, maybe, yeah. Or if anyone wants like last minute question that you want to try to introduce there. Let's see, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end with something if nobody's got any more questions, uh, which is that I spent the last hour kind of getting into the weeds about a lot of technicalities that have uh, uh, about like how things work or like how to do things correctly. Uh, but in most cases, like anybody who has marked their work with the CC license is somebody who like had something that they wanted to share and that they wanted people to be to reuse. Uh, in most cases, like we always want people to do things correctly uh, to make sure that they're complying with the license. But most of the time, like. If you're taking that work and you're making your best efforts to use it in the way that you think it was intended and to mark it and to acknowledge the author correctly, like most of the time, like almost all of the time, you're going to be fine. Uh, like the details are great, but but if you're stressing a lot about it, uh, just know that most of the time, like making a good effort to be fair to the creator and to respect the license, you're going to be completely fine reusing that work uh, because those people intended those works to be shared. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, uh, and and also there's a great Slack community uh, that you I'm sure you've already uh, all seen. Uh, if you have questions or want to discuss with anybody, great, amazing. Um, so uh, thanks uh, so much, God, for this um, very enlightening uh, webinar. Um, and thanks for all the participants for being here. And I hope that the ones that are hearing this recording also enjoy getting their questions answered and um, get to learn some more about the licenses. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Kat and all the participants. Bye. Great.